Welcome back to the swamp my friends and welcome if you're new. Today we're going to be sharing some creepy and downright strange camping horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. Now, before we jump into these stories, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe if you're new as it helps the swamp grow its ever-expanding waters, and get ready for these creepy and allegedly true camping horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. A Very Real Werewolf Encounter by Grimsley Hello, Swamp Dweller. I'm a long-time listener, but this is my first time ever actually telling a story here. I used to live in Anchorage, Alaska. And believe me when I tell you, you couldn't ask for a more beautiful landscape. Sometimes just walking out the door felt like stepping into a painting. Despite this inherent beauty, there are many dangerous things in Alaska that many people may not realize. Such as bull moose charging your car driving between towns because of an emergency due to engine trouble, and how your lungs can freeze if it gets cold enough. Most of these dangers can be prepared for and mitigated mainly due to an exceptional state police force and rescue services. But it would be an error, not to mention that people in Alaska, well, they're just built differently. Folks are tough here, and people are a lot more open to lending a helping hand to a stranger in Alaska. After all, you never know when your life might be on the line. I was about eight years old. My stepdad was a trucker and often spent weeks away from home, whereas my mom worked the night shift as a respiratory therapist at the hospital. I was a rather lonely kid. Alaska doesn't have very many people and my class was incredibly small. I had just moved to town the year before and had difficulty wedging myself into the existing friends group. I'll leave it at that. When my parents did both have long stretches of days off, they tried to make up for the lost time and would take me camping. As a result, I've seen many of Alaska's state and national parks. And holy crow, you have to check these things out. Just don't stay the night. On one of these camping trips, we went to the Denali National Park. The park is massive, spanning 7,408 miles of deep wilderness with an additional 2,085 square miles of nature preserve directly bordering it to the west. The park's northern half is blanketed in thick pine forest spotted with lakes and crisscrossed with streams. The imposing Mount Denali dominates the southern half, a 20,310 foot snow-capped and glacier-bearing behemoth of a mountain. There are all sorts of wildlife from bears to wolves, elk, moose, deer, raccoons, foxes. If you've seen it in a fairy tale picture book, it's probably there. Man, is it gorgeous, except for the mosquitoes. There's a common joke in Alaska that mosquitoes are the state bird. They aren't quite that big, admittedly, but they are more than the size of a quarter. But think about it. These mosquitoes have to punch through thick hide of bears and moose. They are precisely gentle feeders. Anyway, we were set to camp there for two nights. My stepdad was hell-bent on fishing to his heart's content, while my mom mostly just wanted to lounge about and watch animals. I was more interested in exploring, but it was Alaska, and being well-warned and thoroughly scared of the potential predators in such a place, I mostly stayed put and fished with my dad. Things went well that first day. The fish seemed to be biting the bait every 10 minutes or so. I must have had a good spot or maybe just really good luck. I've never caught so many fish in my life. We only kept two to fry up that night for dinner. My mom was in a good mood too since she had seen a herd of elk come down through the stream to drink. We cooked our fish as the sun got low and I listened to them tell stories about their childhoods under what would be the most spectacular night sky I had ever seen. I soon got tired and decided to go to my tent. I quickly fell asleep and that's when things began to get weird. I woke up suddenly, opened my eyes and saw nothing but pitch blackness in front of me. I was startled pretty bad, but then I remembered where I was and laughed at myself a little bit. But then, I heard it. A soft, 
rhythmic scratching sound coming from just outside of my tent near the opening flap. I remembered freezing and just listening. It must be a tree. It has to be a tree. But we didn't camp near any of the trees because my mom thought pine cones might poke a hole in the tent. Now, there are maybe other explanations that could have been figured out by some sort of a more rational person, but for eight-year-old me, if it wasn't a tree making that sound, I didn't know what it was. It could be anything like a boogeyman. My freezing instinct went into full gear now. My chest was so tight, I could barely breathe. It felt like every muscle had been flexed and locked into place. I listened for what must have been a few minutes, not moving, not making a sound. Then, everything just stopped. The next thing I heard was a single footstep, as if somebody had shifted their stance directly outside my tent. Now at first, this was kind of reassuring. I thought, oh, well, it must be my mom or dad checking in on me. I still felt shaky and excited, but I could finally move with that rationalization. I crawled towards the opening flap. For some reason, it was still quiet, and I was trying to be as silent as possible. Some deeper, intuitive part of me knew something was wrong, even if my rational brain was trying to shrug it off. I reached up to grab the zipper. The small metal eyelet touched my fingers no more than once before I heard something more. Whatever was outside my tent, a deep, guttural breath. I froze again, but this time in a more awkward position, with one arm raised, supporting myself like a tripod. I noticed my discomfort pretty much immediately, but could not shift slightly to unjam my wrist from its overstretched position below me. The breathing turned into a snuffle, then a snort. It was then sniffing, sniffing and coming closer to the horrifyingly thin and flimsy, half-centered, thick fabric separating me from whatever creature was out there, whether it be a bear, a wolf, whatever. I began to shake all over. Then I heard a laugh. It was deep, but for that shining moment, I knew it must be my dad trying to scare me. I became relieved, hysterical, and furious all at once. I ripped the zipper down, pulled up the flap, shrieked and peed myself and started screaming some more. The thing I saw standing outside the black and shadowed hole of my meager shelter was without a doubt not my dad. It was hunching over my tent's entrance, standing on two legs. It was covered in fur. I, I couldn't tell the color in the dark, but its eyes were... Its eyes were definitely enormous. If I had to guess and try to put a color to it, it definitely had some sort of amber tint to it. The wolf-like head pulled its thick lips back with enormous fangs showing. Its pointed ears flattened against the back of its skull. It began to growl, sending ripples of sharp panic through the trembling body of myself. Me screaming intensified and got louder. One long hairy arm began to reach out through the opening of my tent, a grasping, clawed hand reaching ever closer. A loud, sudden gunshot rang out, followed immediately by a cracking sound a little ways down the creature's right. The beast whirled to its left so fast I swear it was a blur. Now I could see its back, a long fluffy tail spouted out from the end of the beast's spine. I saw its foot enter my field of view and saw that it was anatomically very similar to a wolf's. Then I heard my dad start yelling and another gunshot rang out. The creature again moved so fast I could barely see it. Within a split second, it was gone into the branches of the woods. My dad ran over to my tent, looked inside for about one second to see if I was alive, and then turned back to the forest. His 50 cal revolver still drawn. I had never before or seen him look so terrified. I started to cry and ask over and over what the heck that thing was. But I don't think we'll ever know. My parents tell me it was a bear, but I think it was something much different. A Horrific Solo Camping Experience by Philip B. Hello, I'm an avid solo traveler, and this is a story of one of my experiences traveling across the United States in 2022. Several people have heard about my story from the colorful Colorado area. I had run into a bear and it was definitely a fight for survival but only a few have heard about the two nights on the trail that compelled me to move to a new campsite. This is the story of one of those nights. 
This event took place in Arkansas, just across the mighty Mississippi River from the Magnolia State. I had heard about a possible campsite at the end of a dirt road in a cypress swamp. I made my way deeper and deeper into the swamp, half expecting to see Hattie Shack or something like that at any moment. I finally arrived as it was getting dark. I quickly set up, boiling some water from my nightly mountain house dinner, probably some sort of beef stroganoff. I had an overabundance of that particular meal, thanks to my buddies Brandon and Raleigh. Anyway... I finished my meal and started setting things up and getting ready for bed when across the swamp I heard something of a knock or maybe even like a pinging sound. If you've ever been in a swamp at night, you know it's alive with sounds of frogs, crickets, otters splashing, and lots of animal noises, so a knock kind of stood out. Not necessarily in a scary way quite yet, but it just caught my attention. A moment later, I heard a second knock, but this time from a completely different location. This happened again a couple of minutes later, one knock to my left followed by a second knock to my right. They were coming from the murky waters of the swamp beside me. This fell into a pattern. I got my flashlight out and edged a bit closer to the water, being sure to be careful of course. As usual, if you have a flashlight across a swamp at night, you'll be greeted with tiny lights also known as the reflective properties of the inhabitant's eyes. Things are getting kind of creepy at this point, but not enough to make me want to leave camp. I go back to the truck and I hear the knock again. This time I also listen to what can only be described as mumbling. Yes, it was answered by a knock and a mumble from another location. As this continued, the location of the sound seemed to be moving around. During all this, my brain decided it was a great time to think about the Issaquina Dam and the stories that I heard that go all the way back to high school. As a kid, one of my favorite books was The Swamp Thing. Suddenly, I'm cursing myself for ever even glancing at the pulp trash. Isolation, darkness, unknown sounds, these things can really wreak havoc on the human mind. The sounds continued, never picking up pace or anything, but an occasional flickering light joined them. It could have been wayward fireflies, the spark of a lighter, firefox, something like that, some sort of swamp gas. The sounds were authentic, though. I was having close encounters with a couple of Bigfoots back in the past, and I think maybe they were curious about me. So I tried to think about the noises that I heard those nights, and they were pretty similar. My more logical self is sure that there was some unsavory swamp people out there doing swamp people business, and they just wanted me gone. Ultimately, I decided it was best if I just rolled out of that spot and go to a different one I had seen up the road. Luckily, my truck setup has a very easy moving camp. It's pretty straightforward and is really simple to set up and break down. As fast as I could, I loaded up, hopped in the cab, and away we went. Once I got away from the swamp, I calmed down, found my alternate campsite, and settled in for a restless night of no sleep. Nothing came from the depths of the swamp to get me, but there was definitely an off vibe. I'm sure that something was out there. I'm just unsure of what it was in those murky waters, but I don't get scared easily. If you camp, especially solo camp like I do, you have to have some thick skin and some tough bones. But this was a night to where the vibe, the energy, it was so palpable you could have cut it with a knife, and I just did not want to chance that. But there you have it. I've been asked many times if I am scared about camping alone, and by far the answer is no. I'm certainly not afraid of animals. I respect and give them distance they require, but I use common sense. So far, so good. Mountain Biking Turned Deadly by Luke My name is Luke and I am now 20 years old. This story happened to me when I was 17. This experience still gives me chills to this day. In May 2017, I found myself going out a lot more on my mountain bike. I was getting bored of cruising around the streets, so I wanted to go out for a trail, woodland bike ride. I have never been to Lee Woods before then. Personally, I do not think I will ever go alone again. After some research into different areas, Lee Woods seemed to be the best bet. Living only a couple of miles away was a nice bike ride. On arriving, 
It looked very peaceful, and I was almost in a dreamlike state by my first look at the place. For a woodland area in England, let alone Bristol, it was amazing. On going into the woods, I remembered seeing different colors at the start of each trail, signifying difficulty for bikers and length for walkers. Don't take my word on that bit. I still have no clue what they mean, honestly. So I decided to go down the blue-colored trail to see what was down there. Finding it exciting, I decided to go down the harder trail, and now, here's where it starts to get weird. I began having this weird sort of vision looking around as if I'm being swallowed by the woodland. Everything felt like it was getting bigger and further away. I brushed it off, but it turns out I lost track of time. I got lost in the trail. Now keep in mind I am very observant and aware of my surroundings. I then came to a strange opening. I could go left in the rough direction of the way out or right deeper into the woods. Me being me, I decided to go deeper into the woods. I came to a weird little trail that just had dodgy written all over it, metaphorically speaking. I went against my gut feeling of turning back and went down there. I came to a point of which the trail continued, but it was getting very dangerous. The trail being too bumpy for me to even walk down, I then turned back. But, for a few minutes before turning back, I do not know why, but I was just standing still, staring down the trail. I felt like I was being watched from all angles even though it would be near impossible to have that many eyes surrounding me in that area. I got nervous and began walking back up the hill as I was too tired to ride at this point. Keep in mind, my bike tires are completely solid, with no punctures, slow punctures, or even anything wrong at all. I wish I still had the pictures of the bike. Upon getting back to the spot where I originally went to the trail, that weird loss of time thing began. It felt as if the whole path had stretched by a half a mile, as if the woodland was moving. I begin walking up the path feeling that same eerie sensation of being watched as I did beforehand. This time, it felt a bit more sinister. It felt as if something were about to happen. Bearing in mind, I had not seen a single person now since I went down that first trail. I will explain the scenery before continuing. It is a long path, a slightly steep hill to my left, a narrow river to my right, maybe four feet deep and four feet wide. Bushes are on the other side of the river, with the odd tree every now and then. Upon getting about a quarter of the way up the slowly inclining path, I hear a woman crying behind a tree up ahead. I start slowing down my walking pace to try and get a look behind the tree, but the whole time I am thinking to myself, why would someone jump across to cry behind a tree? So I edge closer to the river to look behind to see if the person is okay. Also because many people go to Lee Woods to commit suicide, so I was hoping that maybe I could help this person. But you guessed it. There is no one there and the crying stopped. A bit weirded out, I just slowly turned away and started walking again, a bit quicker as I was unnerved. I have had a few paranormal experiences before this, but not in a place like this, never in the woods. Usually it was in a house or some sort of building, so this was new to me. I had this sudden shiver as I was walking, maybe a minute or so later, only a couple of meters away where I heard the crying, it started again, but this time it was opposite of me across the river. I did not bother looking. I started just going again in a bit of a jog. As I got faster, I heard the bushes rustling, as if there was something following me. Upon hearing this, I sped up and the crying became more and more hysterical. Bear in mind, my bike was fine before this moment in time. I have thought to myself, F this, I'm gone. I try to hop on my bike with the adrenaline that was rushing through me, and I come to an almost sudden stop. My back tire on my bike had become completely flat out of nowhere, so I had no other choice but to sprint with my bike and pray for the best, and that I do not trip or end up having to throw it and run faster. With the crying person still close to me and keeping up, 
I am running faster and faster, praying I just get off this path that I was on. I had that feeling of wanting to cry because I could not actually do anything to help the situation or get out of it any faster. And after what felt like an hour, but was probably only five or ten minutes, I could see the car park. The crying had stopped following me and getting closer and started moving back down to where I first heard it. I sprinted out into the car park. I must have been as white as a sheet of paper and hysterical with my breathing and wheezing as multiple people in the car park turned to look at me like I was crazy. I saw the exit sign out of the car park and ran towards it, and, whilst doing so, I noticed my bike to be moving a lot smoother. I could not believe that my bike tire had suddenly regained all of its air. It was solid again, as it was before the unnerving crying person shenanigans. I jumped on my bike and got away from Lee Woods as fast as I could, and have never gone back as every person I tell this story becomes more reluctant to go there with me. The thing that makes this story so scary to me is I have Irish heritage. In Irish folklore, there is a demon that we call the Banshee. She is seen in woodlands next to rivers and lakes washing blood off clothes. It is said that if you see her washing blood off clothes, the person who owns those clothes will die. Alternatively, if you hear her crying, it means death. I cannot remember the meanings exactly of the deaths, but it means either you or a loved one will die. Since 2017, I have lost my auntie, two of my best friends, and a dog. Lee Woods is no joke. There are many stories that have come out of Lee Woods, too. You can read online about them. Search up Lee Woods, L-E-I-G-H. It is rated 87th most haunted place in the UK, according to Higgy Pop. It is a popular spot in Bristol for suicides, or it was at least. Even the ghost of Isambard Kingdom Brunel has been spotted there. Looking over the suspension bridge, which he designed, I may submit some more stories soon, as I have a couple of more experiences I have had over the years. The Invisible Creature on the Roof by Swamp Dweller now this story isn't a rock climbing story, but it is a personal story of mine that I wanted to share with you all. I shared this in a video many years ago, but I'd like to share it for anybody who's new. I grew up in rural areas my entire life. Whether it was beef farms in Tennessee or living in the middle of nowhere Florida, I've done it all really. Growing up without access to most commonalities we have all grown accustomed to, that's right, we had no internet, no TV, and, you guessed it, no cell phones. I know, the horror. We are the last actual generation before the internet age, I like to think. Dial-up was around, but it was something most of us didn't have access to at the time. But honestly, it wasn't all that bad outside of the long, dull summer days when we would be cooking alive in the fields picking green beans. Living in an old Civil War cabin in the middle of nowhere, Tennessee, shelled out some exciting experiences. This story will be one of the many I may share if you all enjoy it. This story starts like any other. It was a typical Friday night and my brothers and I were home alone. As we didn't have much to entertain ourselves with, we began playing search in and around the house, which is basically like hide and seek. We mostly opted to stay indoors as it was pitch black outside. For more context, our cabin was on a steep hill with a long winding driveway. Our place had a basement level, the main level where most of the house was, and the upstairs that only had my room. We also had a back deck that was about 10 to 12 feet in the air. Anyway, back to the story at hand. It was pitch black outside, and going much further than the front porch at that time was something many of us didn't want to do. The game was fun but needed more variety, and with the little room we had inside, it did get kinda stale. At this point, I thought of wandering outside and hiding on the roof to make the game a bit more interesting. This would soon be one of my biggest regrets in life. At first, everything did seem fine. It was rather cold as it was nearing fall and the weather was starting to change. There was a slight breeze and the air was crisp and calming after a few minutes of sitting on the roof, something felt off. I had been practically mesmerized by the sound of crickets and cicadas. 
I realized though that all the noise had suddenly stopped. This to me seemed very odd, but at the same time being a naive teenager, I didn't realize that this only meant something terrible was going to happen. I sit there as still as possible for a moment, trying to listen as closely as I can. I can't hear anything besides the slight breeze through the leaves. Then, an eruption of noise came from the other end of the roof as quickly as the silence came. For a bit more detail, we had a metal roof, making it very easy to hear when things walk on top of it. It sounded like something had landed on the opposite end of the roof. I looked over but could see nothing. This left me somewhat unnerved, and my first thought was to exit the situation. However, before panicking fully, I remembered it could be my brothers messing with me since they did probably give up looking for me by now inside. I opened up my window and called my brothers. They both ran up the stairs shouting and complaining that the roof was off limits. As my oldest brother got to me, I asked him if he had been messing with me and making noise on the roof. He, of course, denied this and wanted to come up and investigate. So he and I slowly made our way to the middle of the roof and listened, just for a moment. Everything went quiet around us as it had earlier. At this point, I was already on edge, ready to karate chop a demon in the neck if I had to. Then, we hear what sounds like a pounding noise on the far end of the roof, in the opposite direction of where we are standing. After three sets of six pounding noises, it charged us. Well, I think it did anyway. It sounded like hooves were running on the metal roof, but the only issue was is we couldn't see a damn thing. The entire roof was clear, aside from us, that is. But somehow, we heard these footsteps. It quickly approached us and began running circles around us. I held out my arms, trying to see if I could feel anything, but I couldn't. The weirdest part was is that I could feel the vibrations of something running around us, but I could see nothing tangible. The footsteps circled us for many minutes, but was probably no more than a minute at most. Suddenly, it ran off to the other side of the roof and seemingly jumped and disappeared into thin air. We quickly ran inside, locked the windows and doors, and huddled up inside, freaked the hell out. To this day, I still don't really know what I experienced, but I can tell you this, there are things we cannot explain out there in this world, and this was one of the many experiences I've had that definitely reaffirms that. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true camping and outdoor horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. If you enjoyed these stories, be sure to slap that like button silly as it helps the swamp grow its ever-expanding waters. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it. If you're new to the swamp, why not join us? Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you never miss a new episode as I upload them nearly every single day on all things natural and supernatural. If you're on the go and don't have YouTube Premium, but still want to download and listen to your Swamp Dweller Scary Stories wherever you are, you can download them absolutely free from Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and pretty much everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. It's absolutely free and always will be. I would love to know in the comments down below what story was your favorite tonight. It helps me pick better stories in the future, and I absolutely love seeing your reviews. If you made it to the end, today's code word is flashing worm. Be sure to comment that down below to confuse anybody who didn't make it to the end. It's always funny to see the comments you come up with, and it's always even funnier to see the people confused when they don't understand what the heck's going on in the comments. Thank you guys so, so much for supporting the swamp the way you do. Be sure to join me over on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it, to keep up with me with all my shenanigans outside of YouTube, and I'll see you all soon with another creepy episode.